You want to talk about zombies? Let's talk about zombies. Now, I don't claim to be a connoisseur of zombie films and media, but I do enjoy the genre from time to time. What I don't like, or rather what I'm disappointed in, is the way that zombies are portrayed in anime. To my knowledge, at the point when I am making this video, a proper zombie anime is an extremely rare thing, and depending on how much you want to argue what is and is not a zombie, you could almost say that a proper zombie horror anime has yet to be made. But before you head down to the comments and rage at me with obvious examples of anime that you think will prove me wrong, several of which I have reviewed in the past, let me clarify about the kind of zombies that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about zombies that by and large are like regular people who just have the random desire to eat brains. So that cuts out Zombie Lone and Tokyo Ghoul. Speaking of, I'm not talking about ghouls either. The traditional ghoul, while occasionally mindless, depending on the story, is usually controlled by a vampire. This can still be horror, but it's a different kind of horror and not really what I'm looking for here. So there goes Helsing and Cheeky. That said, Cheeky did come close by adding in that paranoia that I want, but it's still vampires, not zombies. What I'm looking for are zombies that are mindless, brainless, infectious as all hell, and for there to be a shit ton of them. And I don't want them to just be a set piece for pinup models, nor do I want them to fall in love. I want a story about the undead horde and the plight of the last bastions of humanity, not the result of some fanfic writer trying to become the next E.L. James by replacing vampires or werewolves with zombies in their kinky sex story. Side rant. I should mention that I have yet to watch The Empire of Corpses, which may be the answer to all my problems. The Funimation is taking their sweet time releasing that one on home video, even though they did give it a theatrical release, they never bothered to add a showing in Canada. Yay me. And side rant. So today we are looking at an anime from last season that at first glance, is an answer to all my prayers. I'm just gonna let that statement hang there for a second. Ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Arcada, and welcome to Glass Reflection Today, the 2016 anime from Wit Studio, Cavanary of the Iron Fortress. Let's jab! Zombie apocalypse! Steampunk setting! Samurai in Japan! Crazy train! The weird combination of set pieces is masterful here, let me tell you. So, in this alternate history of Japan, the entire country has been overrun by infected mindless beasts known as cabine, or corpses. Most of the survivors are luckily able to keep them at bay by living in heavily walled cities connected by a massive railroad system. How they build that railroad with the undead horde bearing down on them is never really explained, but it's there, so might as well use it. And use it they do. Carrying supplies from stronghold to stronghold, armored trains travel constantly throughout the country and as such are under constant threat of attack from the cabinet. And the humans deal with them like you would expect. Hold them off the best you can, but if anybody gets bit, they must sacrifice themselves for the good of everybody else. So the onset is good. The paranoia that anyone can become a cabinet is brought into play really early, like first scene. And while the series never dips into horror per se, it never needed to. And let's be honest, it's hard enough to get the paranoia right. Adding proper scary horror elements would be asking too much when they already have the handicap of doing this all animated, which makes horror much harder to be considered actually scary. So we get introduced to our main character, Ikuma, who looks like he was found in a lost pile of Matsumoto sketches. He is an intrepid young engineer who comes up with a piercing gun to quickly dispatch the cabinet. But he quickly becomes a messiah like, I can do anything because I'm the main character kind of character who gets bit by a cabinet. But instead of becoming one of the undead, he gets superpowers instead by becoming what is referred to as a cabinetti. Oh hey, I got bitten by a zombie. Time to auto-erotically asphyxiate myself. It was at this point that I realized I still wasn't getting the kind of paranoia series that I wanted because if one character could gain superpowers from this, 
doubtless others can as well. Even if they don't, the possibility is there. And then the threat of that horde suddenly becomes a lot less threatening. So through a series of stupid decisions by some unimportant red shirts, the initial city the show starts in gets overrun, and the survivors make their way out of the city on the titular Iron Fortress to hopefully survive further onslaught. The train consists of a variety of different characters, from weak-willed assholes to muscle-bound goddesses of strength. And over the course of several episodes, the train makes its way towards the capital, with all of its passengers, including two Cabinary. Oh yeah, there's more than just Ikoma. Moon May is our secondary lead, and honestly the only real character in the show to get any positive development. This might sound strange on the outset because her introduction places her in the camp of I do awesome things because I am awesome. And she is the living embodiment of the idea that anything is possible if you make the acrobatics check. I'd almost say that she's like the series' true main character, as Ikuma's standard bear personality of a typical seinen hero makes him feel more like he's just fulfilling a role rather than, you know, leading the charge. Moonmei's backstory is pretty screwed in the head though with biological experiments, a sometimes crooked sense of right and wrong, and a brother complex to top it all off. But what I liked about her character arc was how quickly it passed over the part of it that I was least looking forward to. In the beginning, with every battle, Moonmei would continue to get more and more reckless, which I predicted would eventually come to a head. She tackles more and more, more than she can handle, and suddenly becomes a damsel in distress. And while that is technically what happened, the show doesn't dwell on it too much, and her recovery to stoic badass happens much quicker than with other characters. Looking at you, Azuna. But as most people will tell you, the biggest problem with this series is the second arc. The first six episodes of the show, barring Yukuma's disposition and development, are really good, borderline amazing at times. But then there's a noticeable dip in entertainment. The whole plot shifts from one of survival to this, what I felt like was a hastily put together yet self-contained story of revenge from a character who's not even introduced until episode seven. The shift is so drastic that I would almost say that it felt like watching a different show. Let me put this in another way. Episodes seven through 12 are an enigma and an anomaly. The status quo that existed at the end of episode six is still in place at the end of the series. This is a show where the threat of characters dying from the zombie apocalypse is a very, very real thing. And yet, I don't think a single character from that first half of the series lost their life to a cabinet in the second half. But that's because it wasn't really their story anymore. So why dwell on them, right? So that's where I got disappointed. The second half did have some entertainment value, sure, but it wasn't to the same caliber that the series started off with. If we ever do get another season, I would hope that the writers try to pretend that this second arc never happened as much as they can. Just do, you know, like a Bugs Bunny cut through continuity, and we'll be fine. Now, as far as the animation goes, Cabinary was done by Wit Studio and directed by Tetsuo Araki. When I did a first reaction of the series, a subject I quickly touched on was the comparison between Cabinary and Attack on Titan, considering their almost identical staff. Allow me to reiterate that comparison. <clears throat> Calling Cabinary Attack on Titan but in steampunk feudal Japan is a really good and quick way to sell the show to people. It's probably the main reason why I started watching the show in the first place. But I think that this inevitable comparison is not entirely accurate. On the one hand, Cabinary is made by the same studio as Titan. It was directed by the same person and has the same art style, the same musical composer, and as far as the development of our main character goes, fairly parallel plot points. However, that's as far as the comparison goes. In Titan, it's semi-steampunk Germans fighting against giant colossal beasts. Cabinary is a much more steampunk heavy series with samurai and railguns who fight against the zombie apocalypse. Just because something is fighting something else does not mean that these shows are copying one another. There are enough major differences that make the series distinct enough stand on its own. Plus, personal opinion, I think that Cabinary actually looks visually better than Titan. Like, Titan was great, but that was three years ago, and I'm impressed with how far Wit has come as a studio since then. I would also say, despite its literal train wreck of a finale, that it also shows a slightly positive upswing in Araki's directing of original work. When paying attention to some of you guys, the viewing masses as the last few episodes of this show aired, I saw quite a few references to one of Araki's previous works. Guilty Crown. Guilty Crown is a series that I reviewed late last year, and I don't actually agree with the comparison between this and Cabinary. I think the comparison between the two was mostly made because the internet community, or at least 
segments of it rather disliked the ending of Guilty Crown, and since they also seemed to dislike the ending of this, and they were both directed by the same guy, then obviously there is a correlation there. But Cabinary was a lot less convoluted than Guilty Crown, at least I thought so. The finale still had major problems and one or two narrative leaps that I didn't think made sense, but it wasn't the same kind of clusterfuck that Crown was. Cabinary, however, did thankfully take the best part of Guilty Crown, by having Egoist perform the opening theme. Egoist is a musical unit derived from Supercell and was just as amazing here as it was there. Because of this, Cabinary's opening is thus far my contender for best opening of the year, even though as I stand here, we still have several months to go. Sawano also came back to work with uh, Araki and did the music for the series as he has with several of Araki's other works, but I'll be honest, as good as a soundtrack as this is, and it is, is very good. It's still just a Sawano soundtrack, so it blends with his other works. It's slightly depressing, but that would only bother me more if I didn't happen to just like his music in general. Overall, Cabinary of the Iron Fortress is a show that I very much enjoyed, but I don't think that it ended up becoming something that's truly memorable. The intro was solid, and for the first six weeks, I was recommending it left and right as the series began, but that stopped quite quickly in the second half. It's still not a horrible show by any means, but I felt as if it had lost sight to what made it entertaining. To bring back my recent D&D comparisons that I've been oh so enjoying, Cabinary is what I would expect out of a campaign when a new member joined and doesn't know how to play nice with the spotlight, so they just hog it all. Sure, having that new character voiced by Mamoru Miyano was awesome and all, but it doesn't excuse the lack of development for the characters that we only just started to get to know in the opening half of the season. And as such, with all of its faults, I can unfortunately only present Cabinary of the Iron Fortress with a recommendation to stream it rather than buy. I'd recommend the initial episodes to most everyone, as they are rather superb, but beyond that, watch at your own risk and pray for a season two. Though, once again, I've hit that snag where actually following my recommendation might be difficult to do. Streaming the show legally is only currently an option if you happen to have Amazon Prime specifically if you live in the United States and have Amazon Prime. Everybody else, including us Canadians, are kind of screwed. Like, there are certainly ways around the region locking, which I went through to, you know, watch the show legally, like I do. But for most people, I think that that's far too much of a hassle, especially for only one series. Now, a home video release. Well, that's actually sort of confusing because of the recent agreement between Crunchyroll and Funimation. As technically, the show was licensed for home video by Crunchyroll, and they previously announced that they were going to release it, despite Amazon having the streaming rights. But according to their now agreement, I would expect that it's Funimation who's going to be distributing the series and possibly giving it a dub. So we haven't heard the details about Cabinary specifically, and we just get to sit and pray that a decent home video release will be forthcoming in a uh, timely manner. As for alternate anime recommendations, I'm gonna skip over the uh, other Tetsuo Araki works that others would consider obvious to recommend. So no um, Attack on Titan, no High School of the Dead. Also with both of these, I don't guarantee that you'll find them to be good. Mostly because I don't guarantee that you'll actually find Cabinary to be good. So there's some similarities there. First up though is the initially hyped and then quickly forgotten series from last year called God Eater. It's a series with a, a similar premise, which looks amazing, sounds amazing, but has some bumps in the road as far as the plot. Second recommendation is a blind one, but I'm bringing it up anyways, and that is The Empire of Corpses. Even though from what I've read, it's a take on Frankenstein and not zombies, I still have high expectations for it. Even though I had the feeling that it's not going to be living up to those expectations. Some of the people that I've talked to about it who actually have watched it have given me mixed reactions, but I'm still hype enough about it to put it here. And sure, I could have copped out and put one of the other shows I've mentioned, like Tokyo Ghoul, but it's really not the same kind of show, so I'm not gonna do that. And hopefully, between these two, you should find something to your liking. And that's it for me. Please subscribe if you enjoyed the video, follow me on Twitter if you feel so inclined and hey. If you like what I do here and feel like helping out, go and check out my Patreon page. And if you feel it within your heart, also consider donating. Very special thanks to Halo Millennium, Grace Anderson, Ludica Adachi, Calhoun Boy, Victor Ekmark, Nikolai Gray, Joshua Garcia, and Mark Robichaud for donating already. You guys are all seriously awesome, and I thank you. Until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, stay frosty.